You're listening to the 3B1B podcast. I'm Grant Sanderson. Today, my guest is Steven Strogatz, a professor at Cornell University who focuses on applied mathematics, in particular chaos and nonlinear dynamics. He's written an absolutely outstanding textbook on that subject, by the way, which I think any students among you should read. But he's also very well known for the popular books that he's written, The Joy of X, um, Sync, and most recently, Infinite Powers, again, all of which I would heavily recommend. I cannot tell you how much I enjoyed this conversation. It's difficult to find anybody out there who loves his field as much as Steven Strogatz does. And I mean love in a very emotive, authentic, bought into it kind of way. And that really shines through here. And in this conversation, you get to learn a little bit about how he fell into it, what got him sucked into the subject. And even more interestingly, some of the things that ran the risk of pushing him out when he was a student um, and the things that didn't necessarily jive as well. And wrapped around all the biographical aspects here, one of the values is you get to listen to philosophies about math exposition from one of the world's best. I mean, he has quite literally won awards for his popular writing, for his teaching. His students clearly adore him and the public does as well. But before diving into this episode, which I enjoyed immensely, a brief word from this episode's sponsor. This episode is supported in part by Brilliant. Viewers of Three Blue and Brown and listeners to this podcast are quite familiar with learning through listening and watching, but often the best way to learn is through solving problems yourself. Brilliant is a website and app that lets you get started. Take their Infinity course, for example. It is full of ton of visual examples and mind-bending challenges that help you to understand the concepts and paradoxes around infinity. And that's just one out of more than 60 courses in math and science. You can check them out today at brilliant.org 3b1b for free. And if you use that particular link, letting them know you came from this podcast, you'll also get a coupon for 20% off their annual subscription. So that's brilliant.org 3b1b. When did you know that you wanted to be a mathematician? Hmm. I had a pretty pivotal experience in high school. I mean, I always wanted to be a teacher. Hmm. So depending how you define what it is that I am, I, I always wanted to be a teacher from very young, certainly before middle school. But I, in terms of being a math professor or or a mathematician like i didn't know about research at that time in my life so I, i'm going to answer the question as if like when did i learn about research and i would say that was sophomore year of high school when uh, i had a teacher mr johnson he was teaching pre-calculus but he offhandedly mentioned a geometry question he said if the angle bisectors of a triangle are congruent prove it's an isosceles triangle hmm. And it sounded like every other question. You know, there are similar questions about medians or perpendicular bisectors or whatever, and those are all pretty easy. But he said, no, this question with angle bisectors is very hard, and I've never seen any student answer it successfully. Hmm. And then he said, of course, that got my attention. But then he said, actually, he didn't know how to do it either. Hmm. Now, that was very surprising to me because Mr. Johnson – had been an MIT graduate. He had a beard. He looked like a mathematician. <laughs> you know, he was kind of a severe but fair, nice guy, but no, like, no worrying about your self esteem or any of that stuff. He he was just play it totally straight, and he expected a lot out of his students. So anyway, he said he didn't know how to do this problem with the angle bisectors, and so I thought, okay, how hard could it be? And so I started thinking about and it. Maybe just so I'm clear on the question, if the well, if the angle bisectors are congruent. Should I say it again? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have a triangle. You, you mm -hmm. look at two of the angles, two of the corners, let's say. You draw a line segment from that corner till it hits the opposite side. And you choose the line segment that cuts that angle in so half. So just two of them have to be congruent or all three. So if two okay. of them have the same okay. length. Okay. Yes, this makes sense. Like the converse question is clear. Yes. If it's an isosceles triangle and you bisect the... Uh, the angles that are equal, you can, by symmetry, see that those, mm -hmm. you know, those two segments will have the same length. But this is the question in the other direction. If two angle bisectors have the same length, that forces the triangle to be isosceles. In particular, the angles that are being bisected are the same. Mm -hmm. And sounds very believable, but when you try to prove it, um, I take it you haven't done this question yeah, yourself. Yeah, I haven't. And now I'm curious. I almost don't even <laughs> want the spoiler, but I, so evidently... I'm not going to tell you how to do it. It's very hard. <laughs> so a sophomore, you, were you like spending your nights then kind of scribbling away, hoping to impress the teacher? Exactly. Exactly. And 
And I'm not sure if it was to impress Mr. Johnson. I would say a certain part of me, yes, it was to impress Mr. Johnson. But part of it was that until that time in school, any math question any teacher asked me, I could eventually get mm -hmm. it, you know, like in a matter of a few hours at the most. But this one, after a few hours of work, I saw a lot of things that almost worked, but I couldn't push them through. Mm -hmm. And so I found myself getting obsessed with it um, because I kept coming close, but I couldn't finish. And so I started thinking about it in French class, you know, like when the teacher would have us conjugate verbs and it's going around the room, each kid having to conjugate some verb, and I can feel it's getting close to me, but I'm still thinking about the angle bisectors. Or I played JV basketball at that time, and guys would pass the ball to me, and I wasn't totally focused on the game. Yeah. So it was, I really got, I was having a mathematical experience for the first time in my life, a true, genuine mathematical experience where you love a problem. It feels challenging enough that you can think about it, but maybe you could do it, but it's not so easy that you can do it trivially. So anyway, I kept thinking about it and, and trying many things. And after about maybe I'd say six months or so, I came up with an argument that I thought worked. And I, I asked Mr. Johnson if I could go to his house and show it <laughs> to him. Um, and it was a Sunday morning. I can remember it because he was in his pajamas. His kids were, he had little kids. He let me into his house. So I, this was a boarding school, okay. and the teachers um, lived not far from the school. And so I walked, I don't know, half hour to get to his house. And anyway, he, he sat me down. We, he checked every line of the proof. And um, by the end, he said, yes, it's, it seems to be a correct proof. And that was it. And what was the feeling <laughs> at that point? Was it one of like elation? Were you disappointed he wasn't more excited? Did you want another problem? Well, I, I thought it was very much like him. But what surprised me was that... He wrote a little note to the headmaster of the school, which I still have. I could probably fish out a copy of it from somewhere. But, but he wrote this note that said, um, I've been giving out this difficult geometry problem to students throughout my whole career. Stephen solved it. He has real talent. Hmm. And I thought, oh, boy, Mr. Johnson thinks I have real <laughs> talent. It really meant a lot to me. So he was writing this to the headmaster, but it came across your desk, nevertheless. Like They sent a carbon copy to me fun. in the days when carbon copy really was on carbon <laughs> <Right>. paper. <laughs> you know, I mean, I really had a little, just a little slip, a little note. They're, they had a special form that, you know, teachers sometimes make comments and send them to the higher authorities. And so he chose to do it on this occasion. And it was very, very thrilling, partly that Mr. Johnson said this nice thing, but absolutely what you already anticipated. Now I wanted another mm -hmm. one. You know, that feeling of exhilaration that finally getting this to work. It seems like often these sort of difficult to solve problems or the idea of solving something that like the smart person in front of you couldn't is actually pretty motivating to someone who's young. And I almost feel like this is one of the appeals of the unsolved conjectures out there, you know, twin prime or any of the millennium problems. And you get a lot of, you know, it's so, it's so tempting for a high school kid to think about three in plus one um, or the Colas conjecture. <laughs> and I actually remember yeah. like thinking more than I should have when I was in high school about the twin prime conjecture and like that kind of feeling. But it's a much hollower experience because yours, you had the right level of difficulty where you could get it after six months. Do you think we should uh, downplay the classic unsolved conjectures and try to do more to dig up things of the same difficulty as this geometry one and kind of broadcast mm. those far and wide? Interesting suggestion. Maybe so. Because I'd be curious what your take is on this, but I found in my own math education, the most instructive thing was doing work by myself on something that really interested me. Homework was fine, but I can remember going like to math team competitions where sometimes at the end of the year there would be a banquet and they would there would be some speaker and the speaker would often talk about some hard problem. And, and those problems interested me. I remember hearing about a problem of four dogs in the corners of a square. They, each dog starts in the corner, and each one runs with, say, unit speed. They all move at the same speed. Each dog runs towards the one counterclockwise from mm. it, but in such a way that it's always aiming directly at mm. it. Okay, so as the, other, as the dogs move along the side, then you come off the side to aim at it there. And then pretty soon, you realize all the dogs are spiraling in towards the center on identical spirals just all rotated from each other. And the question was, how long does each dog run by the time they collide in the center? Mm. 
That's a great question. How, how far has each dog gone? You know, so that was a really interesting question to someone because I loved visualizing things and this had motion, it had change. I mean, I was very, very excited by calculus when I first got exposed mm. to it. So, you know, but the bo there was no recipe for how you do a problem like this. It was just a very natural question. And so anyway, the point was that I spent a lot of time thinking about that chase problem, as I called it. If you look these up, there's this official term, problems of pursuit. Mm. There's, these are well-known problems, but I didn't know it was new to me. Actually, the angle bisector problem is well-known too. It's called the Steiner-Lemus theorem, L-E-H-M-U-S. So people could look that up, but they shouldn't. They should work on it themselves. Hey, do you think you had a benefit of not being able to readily Google the question then? Like, yes. Are, so yes. like kids today, is there, um, I don't know, is it almost a problem that any of these questions can be readily found? It is. I mean, that was the, the larger point I was trying to make. I mean, you already drove at it that, that we teach ourselves. You know, I think a teacher ins can inspire us, but you ultimately, I mean, yes, your teacher can teach you stuff like how to do certain things, algorithms or even, even cool ideas. But the deepest learning is what you teach yourself by struggling. Yeah. And, and struggle has to be fine-tuned the way you say, if it's too hard that you're going to get frustrated if it's too easy, that's no challenge. I think also the fact that there's a sense of ownership. I mean, that resonates a lot. The idea of thinking about some math problem in French class when it's coming. Like, I definitely have memories of these sorts of things where really? there would be some problem that I'm <laughs> contemplating, easily distracted from the other classes. But I think a part of it is you feel like I'm not supposed to be doing this, right? I'm not doing math for school. This is just <laughs> for me. And when it feels right. like a struggle or when it feels um, like there's a lot of pressure that uh, makes it a problem that you can't solve it. It's because you're in a timed environment or it is part of the official regiment or you're getting some score on it. Like all of that that goes with the usual school machinery potentially robs it of that pure play. At, at least this was my experience with it. Mine too. I mean, I, I was always good at the game of school, mm -hmm. you know, getting grades and all of that. So I didn't mind that. But, but this was a different experience because as you say, there was no time pressure. I didn't tell Mr. Johnson I was working on the angle bisectors. I was just doing it on my own time. My friends knew I was because it was irritating them <laughs> because I would be unavailable. Right. You know, they'd want to do something. And I'd say, I feel like thinking about the pro Oh, God, that problem again. You're in the outfield of the baseball <laughs> game and you're just like <laughs> head in the sky, not catching what you need well, to. So, yeah, I mean, I really did, I did. Ownership is a good description of it. I felt like it was my problem. And then fast forwarding, once you did end up um, in, in college and maybe starting to think more seriously about being a researcher, were there more problems like that that kind of struck you as pivotal experiences? Very few in college, actually. College math was pretty discouraging to me, I would say. Mm. Tell me more. Well, yeah. I my First of all, I, I had never been trained to do pure math, to do proofs. Our classes were mostly about calculating this or that. We did have proofs in geometry. Like, after all, this angle bisector question was a proof. But in senior year of high school, I, I was teaching myself multivariable calculus out of the book by Thomas. And my, the teacher who was supposed to be checking in on me, because there was no one else in the class, it was just, they just bought the school, bought me a book, and I worked on it myself, and I would report back to this certain teacher, Mr. Moran. But Moran was always trying to get me to learn about metric spaces. Mm. He would write down the axioms for a metric space and try to get me to prove this or that. And I just wasn't interested in that. I wanted to learn Maxwell's equations because Einstein had said they were, you know, very important in his life. And I had a big Einstein fetish. And um, so I wanted to know what Maxwell's equations were, which meant I needed to learn about divergence and curl. So that's where my head was. I was a born applied mathematician, but I didn't know those words at the time. Well, how come you never went into physics or, I mean, it almost seems like that mindset of I love wanting physics. to you know, follow in Einstein's tracks. Yeah, I love physics, but I didn't have a good head for physics, you know, in terms of physical intuition. I'm not, um, I don't like to play with gadgets. Mm. I don't like, don't have any curiosity about doing experiments. Mm. Um, I think I have a very impressionistic view of the physical world. I like the math underlying the physical world. I don't really, not that interested in science, honestly. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> it's terrible to admit. I shouldn't. I, nobody else is going to listen to oh, this, this conversation. This is on record now. <laughs> Steve Strogast doesn't care about <laughs> science. <laughs> well, I mean, this is really um, heresy for an applied mathematician to say this because we're, in our culture, we're supposed to say, 
we use math to solve improv, you know, important problems in physics, engineering, biology, medicine. In my heart of hearts, I see those subjects as sources of inspiration for cool math mm. problems. I don't, I don't really care truly about physics or medicine or biology. Like if I think about fireflies flashing in unison, I don't really care about how real fireflies do it. I like the abstract problem of how does a group get itself organized. Mm. So the real world offers a grounding for interesting pure puzzles that the axiomatic approach never quite got for you. Yes. Exactly. To me, metric spaces were dry. Why would I care about that? No, there are good reasons, but but it wasn't presented to me that way. So that so that's why I say college was kind of a turnoff, largely. I, well, again, that resonates a lot, and I think with a lot of people, where you the reasons that you like math a lot as a you know up and coming, bushy tailed, bright eyed high schooler feel very different from what comes at you in college in terms of. Uh, yes. Exactly what you're describing. I mean, everyone has it in some very, maybe it's not metric spaces, but it's the abstract vector space definition, or it's that first group theory class that you take, or the number of people who mm -hmm. I've met who say, I thought I liked math, and then I took a set theory class. And it's mm -hmm. almost like there's this weird step back into, okay, we've really got to train you on the formalisms before you can do real math, which maybe that is necessary. I, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Is, is that... Um, that level of rigor and um, introducing people to the even framing of modern pure math, like a necessary pill that we all have to swallow, this chore that we should have to endure in order to appreciate what the modern field is, or if you could wave a wand and reconstruct the you know Princeton undergraduate math experience, mm -hmm. is there a way we could make it better but accomplish the same goals? I do think so. Uh Let's talk about that. It's a, I love this question because this gets into the larger themes I think you want to explore today about exposition. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not just about education, but also how mathematicians talk to each other and to other scientists. Mm -hmm. um, and I think all of these things can be summed up in one little phrase, which is, it helps to love the question. Mm. You, you, as a teacher, as an expositor, as a writer, you have to help the student, the reader, love the question. Or, or even, I mean, that's a high bar. At least understand the question, but better love the question. So let me give you an example of this, actually with metric spaces. Okay. Yeah, tell me. Okay, so when I was a junior in college, after, you know, being probably like the worst math major in my cohort by, by the measures of grades, I loved the subject more than most of my fellow students, by the way. But I wasn't very good at pure math, which I was at Princeton as, you know, an undergrad. Pure math was the only math. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wasn't ever understanding why would I want to think about, you know, if I'm doing a double integral and I have to prove that it, mat it doesn't matter under certain conditions, which order I integrate, mm -hmm. you know, I, like things would have to be pretty pathological for that to be a problem. <laughs> why do I care right. about this? So I never did, and I never, of course, I was lousy at real analysis with that kind of attitude. I didn't understand the delicacy of those questions. But as a junior, I uh, was looking for a summer job, and I saw that a, a kid who was older than I was, who had just won a Rhodes Scholarship, a kid named Eric Lander, who, who went on to become a famous person. Um, he's now the presidential science advisor to Joe Biden, mm -hmm. but he's also a very great geneticist and you know, like one of the world's top biologists. Anyway, he was a very brilliant mathematician as well as later becoming all those other things. So he got a Rhodes Scholarship and there was a write-up of him in the Princeton student newspaper that said he spent a summer teaching math at this math camp at Hampshire College. Mm -hmm. And I thought that sounds interesting because I always wanted to be a math teacher. Maybe I could teach at Hampshire College like Eric Lander did. So I applied for that job, and they ended up letting me be a junior staff member teaching high school, you know, little whiz kids, some of whom have themselves become famous people, like Lisa Randall, the theoretical physicist. She was one of oh, my wow, students. Oh, wow, this is exciting. And um, Alan Edelman, who's, you know, does is in the professor in the math department at MIT now. Anyway, there are a lot of interesting kids there to teach. But what was so interesting is that the, the faculty, the, the senior staff, some of them were the best teachers I'd ever seen. Mm. Very different from my professors at Princeton, who, a lot of whom were not that interested in teaching undergraduates. So here, so let me come to the point of the story. One of the teachers, a guy named Ken Hoffman, who was a, a, a Hampshire College professor, asked the students one day, 
what's the distance between the sine function and the cosine function? <laughs> oh, that's delightful. So isn't that a delightful question? Yeah. Because you immediately think, what does that mean? Yeah. Which is a good question. What does that mean? Yeah. So then he, he got the students thinking, well, what does that mean? How would you measure the distance between sine of x and cosine of x? Should you measure it? I mean, of course, at different x's, it's a different distance. Mm -hmm. But if I want to give one number, what should I do? Should I measure the area between them? Should I measure the maximum distance between them, you know, point-wise or what? So eventually, by thinking about this question, how would you generalize the question of what's the, you know, like we know what the distance between two points is. Well, what's the distance between two functions? Yeah. And, and so it led the students to all kinds of cool definitions, which basically they were defining different metrics on the space of functions. And pretty soon, all the axioms of a metric space were tumbling out because mm. we had a question to fall in love with. Yeah. And so like that feeling of being the inventor rather than just being the consumer of a previous invention seems important. Right. And right. also what seems relevant here is by the time you're wanting to give axioms to a metric space, you have at least a separate example in mind. Because if initially you yeah. go at it and you know what space is, you know what distances are, like why are we formalizing this? There's no reason until you have, oh wait, we want it to apply to this separate thing. I remember a clicking moment for like fields, like understanding why we had all these axioms around fields um, in thinking about like finite fields that, oh wait, maybe it's not just, I care about like real numbers or uh, describing, you know, linear algebra on top of that. Oh, I guess a lot of computer science, like it's not using real numbers, it's using this other thing because like you don't have infinite space <laughs> in your computer. Maybe we should really check, like do the same rules apply? How do you check if the same rules apply? And it's only at that point uh -huh. that you go back and say, wait, what are the foundational rules? Yeah, I mean, a, a similar um, comment to that earlier one of that you need to help people love the question is, is to phrase it a more negative way. What so often we do wrong in school and in our math papers is we give answers to questions that the person hasn't thought of asking. Mm. We spend so much time on answers, uh, like we're doing someone a favor by giving them answers. That's not the favor. The favor is to help them think, help them love the question so that they can come up with answers. I mean, you could guide them to answers. I'm not saying everyone has to reinvent the wheel. Like in the case of metric spaces, if you really understand why you would want these concepts, it really helps. Mm. And so did you find yourself sitting there as, you know, one of the teachers for the, this math camp, like with a, a different appreciation once you went back to your undergrad for what some of these terms were? Or was it more something that seeded you with a sense of what good teaching can look like? Much more the latter. Yeah. Yeah, it was the second thing. I, because none of my teachers were using this kind of approach. Right. Back, back at Princeton, they just dumping, you know, one theorem after another on us and, and the definitions were very unmotivated. And the whole thing was, for me, very unpleasant. Mm. But occasionally, things would break through. So I, my complex analysis teacher, uh, whose name was Stein, who's, I mean, these were all great mathematicians. I, but Stein clear. was Yeah, this is Eli good. Stein. He's a really good. He was a really great teacher as well as a great mathematician. And when he proved the really the sort of central theorem of elementary complex analysis called Cauchy's theorem, uh, he did it was to show that the integral of an analytic function, so earlier in the course he defined what that means, basically that it has a derivative. I don't know what I should say for your listeners if I how would much say, we want to assume. <laughs> talk to me as me, and then if we want to like delve down on, okay. uh, on details, we, we can do that. So but, let's suppose yeah. you know what an analytic function is. I'll just yeah. continue with the story then. The statement is that when you integrate an analytic function around a closed curve, um, if it's analytic on the curve and inside the curve, you'll get zero, mm -hmm. no matter what the curve is or what the function is, as long as it's analytic. Okay. So Stein said, you know, let's prove this for a triangle. Hmm. And, you know, I was willing to go along with that. It sounded, first of all, it reminded me of things in fluid dynamics or in electricity and magnetism. It felt like doing no work as you go around mm, yeah. the closed curve. So the idea that you could have like an irrotational flow or something, you know, or a curl-free uh, field, did, did Stein make those connections? Yeah, he might have. He might have said that. I don't know if he, he wouldn't have talked about applications because he never really did. I guess, there's, well, there's an application and then there's just a, like a metaphor almost or like an analogy. Yeah. I doubt he, I don't think he, I don't remember. But, he, but what I do remember is he drew the triangle and I, th I remember thinking to myself, how's he going to prove this? Like <laughs> there's not enough information. All he has mm. is a triangle and it, it's an arbitrary function. So then he started drawing a triangle inside the triangle. Mm. So that is, he d d 
drew a dot at each midpoint of each side and connected them in a smaller triangle. And then he kept doing that so that there was this nested family of triangles shrinking down, triangles inside of triangles. And it really looked like a fractal. But this was the days before fractals were a thing. Mm. I mean, this was in the early, this was in the like mid-70s. So mm. the fractal book from Mandelbrot is, didn't really catch on until around the 1980s. I think Fractal Geometry of Nature is 1982. I was about to ask when that was. Okay. Yeah, I think it's 1982. Uh, I think he had a smaller book on fractals that was around the mid 70s, but I wasn't aware of it. I wasn't reading, you know, research monographs. That one was not so much for public <laughs> consumption right. as the later Fractal Geometry of Nature. I think that's what it was called. Yeah, um, I, in my head, I've, I've always mixed it up saying the fractal geometry nature or the fractal nature of geometry. <laughs> Very different things, but I, I really want the second book to be written. Yeah, well, anyway, the point being that Stein gave this beautiful proof, and, and by the end of it, you could see exactly where the assumption that the function was analytic was getting used, mm. and it was a proof that had a quality of like the best music, that, mm. that there's a buildup you know, there's a feeling of surprise, You then a feeling of inevitability. You can see something coming. Is it going to work? Everything's canceling out. Boom, it works. And I, I was so overwhelmed, I started clapping. Really? In the middle of this lecture. Wow. Really clapping hard. hard. <laughs> did did and, anyone else join you or was this the no, single? <laughs> every head in the room whipped around looking at me like I was a lunatic, including oh Stein looked at me like I was somebody strange. That's and, outstanding. I thought, this is the best proof I've ever seen. I mean, it was such a great, it is a fantastic proof. It's, it's actually not Cauchy's proof. It's attributed to another mathematician named Gorsat. Uh, but, so this is Gorsat's proof of Cauchy's theorem, better than Cauchy's proof, and mm. better than Gauss's proof, since Gauss discovered Cauchy's theorem before Cauchy. That's mm. another story. But <laughs> anyway, so I was capable of being inspired by pure math. It just took a masterful teacher. And so let's talk about what constitutes a masterful teacher here. So you had some exposed in that um, camp. You had Eli Stein. If you could try to pass along a set of principles to educators out there in you know, trying to restructure how undergrad math is taught, I mean, you've said you have to love the problem, but that can maybe be unpacked into what makes someone love a problem. Is it the applications? Is it the symphony-like beauty of Gorsat's proof? Is it the enthusiasm of the educator themselves? Is that enough to instill love? Uh, like what, what are the different things that you would fill out in this list of principles to try to, you know, revamp how we do pure math? I, I have a very broad attitude about the answer to that question. I don't know the answer to that question because I don't think there is one. Hmm. I think there are many, I think you've touched on three good things that work for some students. So for some people, knowing the history and the context is very motivating. Some people like the competitive aspect of math, you know, math contests, math team. As a little boy, I used to love that. I loved getting a higher grade than my best friend. Mm, so, yeah. you know, back when I was in Mr. Johnson's class, the idea that I could make Mr. Johnson be impressed with me or that I could do it and my friend can't do it, that was motivating at the time. That wouldn't be motivating to me today. Seeing real world applications is exciting for some people. Seeing beautiful logic is great. You know what, though? When I ask my daughters, what do they like about math? They would never say it's beautiful. That's not, it's not beautiful to them. The word they use is satisfying. Hmm. They say, I like it when it works. I like it that it comes out right. And when they say Isn't it works, is it in the spirit of solving something else or just it, as its own little isolated package no. that itself It's like that you did a crossword puzzle and all the, num all the words fit. Mm, yeah, no one would, or few people would maybe describe a Sudoku as beautiful. But right, Sudoku satisfying. or crossword, no one says it's beautiful. It's satisfying that it all fits and it works. And I think we forget, because we're constantly thinking, oh, beauty is the remedy. You know, like we have to show students math is beautiful. Well, you know what? Beauty, I, I, look, a lot of me believes that, but beauty is very exclusionary. If someone doesn't get how beautiful something is, they feel doubly left out. Hmm. You okay. know, that's they, actually helpful to hear because I often do think about almost kind of like a personal mission is sharing the beauty of math. But of course, it had never occurred to me that there's something exclusionary about that. Potentially, except but, you're yeah. so good at it. I think that people through your videos and your fantastic explanations, you know, plus they don't have to watch. They're not forced to be in your 
<laughs> I, well, I, I think that's a lot of it, right? Is that the idea that the context is already one of someone having opted in rather than yes. being pushed in. And that, I mean, that just gives you so much freedom. So it's, it's infinitely more challenging as an actual teacher in front of actual right. students who haven't opted in. We also left out the, the thing that most parents would be thinking about, which is that the kid may be able to get a better job because of the math that they're learning. Mm. And so for some people, the idea that, like if you go back and watch Stand and Deliver and see how um, uh, Jaime Escalante, the teacher in Stand and Deliver, I don't know if you've watched the movie, maybe. I some of your listeners yeah. may not have. Oh, you should watch it. Oh, okay. I mean, this was a real guy. Jaime Escalante was an aerospace engineer who then left his job to teach in East Los Angeles, kids who were written off as, you know, they have no potential for anything just to be criminals. And I've had some of his students as my graduate students. Hmm. And Mr. Escalante was a very, very inspiring teacher, but he wasn't going on about the beauty. Hmm. He was going on about, you want to be flipping hamburgers or you want to be working at an aerospace company. That feels like a hard tightrope to walk because if, if you're, let's say you're teaching the quadratic formula, and, you know, you've just got a lot of things. Maybe you want to factor it. Maybe you want to complete the square. Maybe you're plugging in the formula. And the student raises their hand and says, am I really going to be using this in any job? Yeah, but the answer is no, but you're going to need this to get out of the, the situation you're in. Mm, okay, yeah. Just, so you're just I'm going to help you out. Of, I'm going to help you change your life. Mm. So it's not an intrinsic thing. I mean, math doesn't have to be loved for math's sake. Math can be loved for that it will save you from, from the fate that you might be destined toward otherwise. I mean, it's crazy. We don't ever talk about this, but that's because there's a whole elitist, you know, like a lot of us come from families where we don't have to think about stuff like that. That's very and true. So I'm just trying to make the point that there are dozens of reasons why math might be meaningful or exciting to someone. And I don't think any one approach will work for everybody. So I try everything. And, you know, for some kids, the 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 job-related explanation is very mercenary and uninteresting, whereas the beauty and the poetry is very exciting. Okay, I try everything. I just try to hit every button I can in the hopes that occasionally I will hit your button. <laughs> and in your experience as a teacher, do you have some loose sense of maybe the, the pie chart there of what, what's your first pass for what tends to work to try to get someone engaged with the material and loving it? And if that doesn't work, what's the second pass? Like, is it a majority of people who seem to like the beauty of it, majority who are more into the application? Or do you just look at them in the eye and kind of case by case try to get to know them? I, I, yeah, that is the best. But um, for the students I have taught, which, you know, my job was mainly in an engineering college. So I was hired at Cornell to teach math to engineers, which I did for most of my time here. I've now recently moved into the math department. And so I have somewhat different students than I used to have. Um, so, the, so the answer might have changed a little bit. But I, if I had to choose one thing, I think intuition is the most reliable hmm. way to get people to like math. If you give intuitive arguments, if you help them see why something makes sense, why it should be true, how to think, not the formal part, the intuitive part. Well, that would seem to suggest it's it's the mere fact of understanding that serves yes. as an inspiration. I think it does. I think without that, you can't be happy. <laughs> I guess it's, you could. I guess you could be a trained seal and just do what you're told. <laughs> but I think... I, I, <laughs> well, it's clear that it's necessary. What's a little bit more surprising is if it's sufficient or close it to might it. Be. Yeah, I think it's pretty close to sufficient. I think if you give people the intuitive feeling for anything, and it doesn't have to be a hard topic. It could be, you know, why why is multiplication commutative? You know, like to me, that was a big thrill when I was a little kid hmm. to be learning the multiplication table. And I didn't know at first that two times nine was nine times two. In fact, it tripped me up in fourth grade. I, when I was in third grade, I was getting into trouble in class. I was um, so bored. I used to do little jokey things to make my friend Rodney laugh. And then we would both get in trouble and I would be sent to the principal hmm. because I was so bored. So fortunately, someone in the school system said you're not really a bad kid. You, sh you must be bored. We're going to put you in fourth grade tomorrow. Hmm. So I just skipped a whole year of school in the middle of the year. And my teacher in fourth grade, I think, resented having a new student. And she gave us a multiplication quiz that day with 25 questions with very little time. You had to know your times tables hmm. by heart. And I didn't know any times tables. I only knew that nine times two meant 
that I had to do two plus two plus two plus two <laughs> nine times. <laughs> and I we couldn't do add it up fast enough, and then she was on to the next question. Mm-hmm. So if I had known it was the same as the other way around. Anyway. <laughs> you found yourself like strangely motivated by this one. Yeah. I mean, when someone showed me, look, take nine nine dots in two rows and then rotate it, and it's the same as, you know. What's funny there is that like the reason that that's inspiring is because you were doing it in such a hands-on way and that you had skipped over the rote aspect of just memorizing the whole table to begin with. To like yeah. engage with it before, like you should memorize it at some point, but to engage right, with right, it right. at that level before memorizing, maybe... I don't know, maybe it was to your advantage to have skipped that second half of third grade. I, I don't, I actually did memorize it before I understood it. So I don't mm-hmm. remember when I learned that picture of rotating the rectangle of dots, but the thread was, the thread was supposed to be intuition. That if you said, what, what works better than anything? I think if we would slow down as teachers and not cover the material in such a rush, but give students an intuitive feeling for why each thing we're doing makes sense, why it's interesting, um, and you know why it is the way it is, like whether that's a definition or how to set up a proof or how to finish the proof or how to do a calculation. I'm all about intuition. If you look at my teaching reviews on like rate my professor or something, I'm not saying you should, but or, or, you know, someplace that's publicly available. I, I think the students will talk about I use a lot of humor. I'm very lighthearted. I'm not serious with that. Well, th- this comes through in the lectures of yours that are visible online. Well, I can't help it. That's who I am. <laughs> well, can I ask a little bit? So you, you've posted these lectures for classes that you've taught uh, on, onto YouTube. Is there a restriction for more teachers doing that? Is it just a matter of people being willing to? Are there logistical challenges with universities to uh, publishing these things? Why, why is it the case that you're one I don't of the know. exceptions? I don't know. I, I did it just because um, during the pandemic, I was taping them anyway. Mm-hmm. So I thought, why not? But... Uh, but the ones, the nonlinear dynamics lectures that I posted, I just felt like the world might, some students out there might find it interesting if they're in a country where they can't afford to buy the book. Did Cornell, like, did you have to get permission from anyone associated with that? No, or? no, anyone could do it. There, it's a, it's my intellectual property. Nobody, hmm. the what Cornell gives you the, is the degree. The knowledge is free. MIT already showed this with open courseware, right? They're giving it all away. I remember. And I'm, I'm going to be hazy on the details, so maybe I shouldn't bring it up. There was some case where because there wasn't sufficient captioning on some online lectures that were put out, it might have been from MIT or maybe it was Harvard. The, yeah. the school got in a little bit of trouble, I think, from the, um, like the hearing impaired community. That's uh, reasonable. That's reasonable. You know, you want to make but sure let's it's accessible solve that. Um, yeah. and solvable. But, you know, so some people uh, feared that it's this added bit of friction to put things up in the first place. Where what would make sense is put it out first and then like work hard to make sure it's as accessible as possible. But if it would be an impediment to putting it out at all, that maybe making that a, a necessary requirement was, I, I, again, maybe I shouldn't bring it up because I don't remember the details, but there was fear of it being a little bit of a cause for someone to not even post it in the first place. Uh-huh. I, I don't know. That may have inhibited some people from posting, but if you would ask me, why don't I videotape all of my lectures? It's expensive mm. under the old model. Like the one that I did, we had to pay $5,000 to have someone with a video camera who would follow me at the blackboard going back and forth like that. Yeah. And so, you know, it just was prohibitive in that sense. But now with doing it on Zoom where I just hit a button and it records it, it's easy. Even then there's that little challenge though of you got to upload it, you've got to... It's a yeah, there's a little time. challenge. Maybe you set things up. And... <laughs> well, Google will give you some motivation by paying you a few pennies for it. <laughs> Although, yeah. if you have millions of views, I guess it could be more than that. But, um, but for most of us, it's just going to be, it's not for any financial reason you would do it. Just, I, I love that about the internet. I've learned so much from your videos, from so many other people on the internet, and about all kinds of things. Just this morning when I was playing tennis, my friend, uh, my tennis partner said he's learning about our history, about Hieronymus Bosch. You know, oh, somebody okay. has put up some cool. <laughs> yeah. So it's, fan- I think, you know, as, as gross as the internet can be and often is and a force for evil, it's also a force for good. And we might as well use it, you know, as much as we can for on the good side. I recognize maybe I'm straying a little bit off the beaten path here, but I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, like, it feels like there must be this high potential to pair together people who want to make videos and online content 
with academics and professors who are teaching it anyway and doing a great job and have the know-how. Like on the one, you have one side of this equation of so many people want to be YouTubers. You ask kids these days, what do they want to be when they grow up? And I don't know if this is disheartening or not, but by far the <laughs> largest answer will be they want to be a YouTuber. Are you serious? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's real? And, yeah, I, it's unclear whether what they have in mind is an extremely generic sense of, I want a sense of creative freedom to like do what I want to do, or if they're pattern matching off of vloggers. Like depending on what they have in mind, it's either kind of inspiring or incredibly uninspiring. That that well, is let me the make sure I understand the claim. Is this something you've that, that comes from a reliable source? This is the truly the most popular answer now? So, okay, I, I should properly look up this. It was among middle schoolers, um, I can find the source for you and then throw it in the show notes and potentially <laughs> add asks. Okay, I'm not challenging you. I just find it a shocking challenge. answer. No, it's, it's the right thing yeah. to challenge. But you say, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, and the, the top, the plurality, say YouTuber. Yeah. Um, wow. And that falls above things like, you know, doctor or astronaut. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. Go on with the. So, what was the. Yeah, take, that, take from that what you will in terms of disappointment. Um, <laughs> well, no, it, it's interesting. It means you have this side of equation of people that want to make content. On another side is folks like yourself um, and other, or not, let's say, not even say ones like yourself, but excellent educators who haven't yet put stuff out there, right? There's so much potential energy on both of those sides that it feels like adding some kind of connector is, in principle, a cheap way to get high bang for your buck on putting this out there. You know, the kid who wants to animate things, let's say he went and just animated a lot of your chaos and nonlinear dynamics lectures. Yes. <laughs> what value add would there be to that, right? It would be incredible. Yes, there would. It would and be, it would be yeah. much better than him going off like making cartoons in the hope of addressing a following, which... Well, I only was thinking easy. very selfishly, yes, it would be incredible for me. I hope it would be <laughs> incredible for anyone who wants to, you know, learn that material or is curious about it. Yeah. That's not even a question, just sort of throwing it out. No, it's not a question. I know. I'm sort of stunned by the whole thought of it. I, I do like the Wild West aspect of it, you know, that people with a good new idea. Yeah. As you say, you spoke about friction. There doesn't seem to be that much friction for someone who's motivated to just start putting their stuff up. And so we're discovering a lot of cool, often young people around the world doing very creative, interesting stuff on, often on YouTube, but it could be TikTok, whatever. Yeah. Huh. Shifting gears a little bit back into okay. uh, a little bit of your path into all of this. So you, you're into this undergraduate program where maybe you're finding yourself less inspired about math research than you had been yeah. as a high schooler. What was the turning point back in the direction of wanting to be a researcher? Well, um, it was a couple of things. I, in junior year of college, decided to be pre-med. There was family pressure. Really? Yes. Oh. There I was. No I, so, well, so I thought I was going to be a math major. I got very discouraged from my freshman rigorous linear algebra course. I thought, ah, I'll try one more. And then I tried the rigorous honors calculus, like advanced calculus, proving the theorems of calculus mm. and definitions of compact sets and stuff like that. And um, I thought, oh, God, this is as bad as the first semester. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And so, um, so my advisor said, you don't have to take this. You could take the math with the engineering students. And, and so that was much more to my taste. I could do that with my eyes closed. I mean, that was fun and easy. Mm. So I thought, oh, I st okay. But then I thought I'll be a physics major. Mm. You know, so you already sort of suggested why not be a physics major. I love my physics courses. So I thought, okay, I'll do that. But then I had Stein in mm. complex analysis. And I thought, oh, God, I do love that. <laughs> so maybe I can do math after all. Really? You so know, Stein like was if it's, the turning point? Yeah. To Stein was very that, yeah. pivotal for me because I it gave me the confidence that it was possible for me to do math, not for engineers. I didn't take the complex analysis for engineers course. Mm -hmm. I took the complex analysis for math majors course. And I could do that because it was calculus just with Z instead of X. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> um, and it, it didn't have the messiness of real analysis. Right. right. I didn't know about that yet. Yeah. So then when I got back to real analysis, then I was suddenly no good again. So I was kind of just stumbling around. Um, but then differential geometry, I was great because I could visualize everything and it was calculus again, but now on surfaces or, or you know, manifolds. What was the first bit of um, research you found yourself doing? Was it in undergrad? Was it in- Yes, uh, it was. It was as, so as undergrad. All right, let me try to speed up the story. So I'm- oh, No, so don't, I'm, don't, <laughs> don't rush it okay. on my account. Well, I mean, so, cause it's all tied together here. I'm, so it's junior year. I'm, I'm enjoying the differential geometry course, but my family has said, you know, what are you gonna do with math? 
uh, my parents had not gone to college. They didn't know much about, you know, like what was out there for me. And they were very supportive of me. They were not tough that way. But my brother was a lawyer, my older brother. And um, he said, why don't you think about taking the pre-med courses? Because I know you're not that interested in being a doctor, but if you took those courses, you might actually like them. Like biology and chemistry, you like science. You might actually like that stuff. And uh, I know you're resisting being a doctor because everyone says to do it, so you're just being stubborn. That's fine, but but maybe you should just take those courses. It doesn't mean you have to be a doctor, but it's going to be a lot easier to take them now than to take them later. I thought it was a pretty good argument. So so I switched and started taking all those courses. And the truth is, I liked them. Hmm. They were very interesting. I liked organic chemistry. I liked biology. Um, and I also liked my math courses. But then I started to realize in my senior year, since I was being pre-med so late, I wasn't going to be able to take quantum mechanics, mm. which I had always dreamed of taking my whole life. You know, I mean, I'd been reading about Einstein and Bohr and Heisenberg and Schrodinger since I was a little boy. And I, I told my mother I'm never going to get to learn it because I have to take vertebrate anatomy and stuff. <laughs> and and she said, what if you could just say, God damn it, I just want to be a math professor hmm. and I'm going to take quantum mechanics. Like she didn't know what quantum mechanics was. Right. But she saw she the passion said, I can in see. She saw my face. She saw I was so sad. She said, what's wrong? You look so sad. And I didn't know I was looking that way. But she said, you could just take quantum mechanics. You could do what you want. And I burst out crying. I mean, it was the biggest liberating moment of my whole life, I would say, to this day. I have to say, I... Like admire and I'm almost jealous of the level of emotional investment you had in all of the like that you're applauding <laughs> for Gorsat's proof or that you're crying to be able to take quantum mechanics. I really love my subject. Clearly, I just do. I I, I really do. I mean, that shines through so much. Yeah, I'm not very good at it, oh, and I'm not, not saying true. it with false modesty. I, well, okay, maybe the point is there's a lot of ways to be good. Hmm. Okay, the way that school tells you is good. I wasn't good that way. Hmm. I I was slow. I'm still slow. I can't do well on a fast standardized test. My GREs were lower than you would think. My SATs were lower than you would think. Um, but I had certain other strengths. I like seeing connections. I mean, the stuff I was learning in my differential geometry class about curves and twists and, and ribbons and things reminded me of what I was learning about DNA. So that's to come back to your question, what was my first research? I asked my senior uh, thesis advisor, can you think of a problem that would combine geometry and biology? I like both. Hmm. And he said, well, there are some questions about DNA and how could it all fit inside of a cell, given that it's so long hmm. and it doesn't get tangled. Can you figure out what it means for a curve not to be tangled? And can, can you prove that DNA is not tangled? That turned out to be way too hard for a senior thesis. Well, I mean, that has that flavor of like coming up with the right definition. Yeah, it does. It does. No, it was a brilliant question, but it was he was really setting me for something that was more <laughs> of a PhD thesis. I mean, that problem is still not solved to this day, as far as I know. Hmm. But, it, but it got me learning about DNA and um, the differential geometry and elasticity theory of DNA when it's uh, this twisted coiled molecule. And so I, I lapped it all up. Wouldn't have been possible without that pre-med year or without the differential geometry course. That's interesting. So... So I ended up doing really good research, in fact. Hmm. I, uh, the this thing was, I, so I had an idea. I went, someone told me there's a biochemist here who works on DNA geometry. You should go ask him about your idea. I talked to the guy who was a very excitable Argentinian. Um, I mean, it's not relevant about the country, but he, he, it felt relevant to me. He was very hot, <laughs> jumping around, arguing, um, manic sort of personality. Our Professor Warsell was his name, Abraham Warsell. So I told him my idea, and he said, what, I'll tell you the idea. The idea was that DNA cannot be a double helix. Oh. Despite what you learn, it cannot be a double helix because you'll find this an interesting yeah, argument. Yeah, tell me, tell me. I'm so curious. So, okay. So, so DNA, of course, we had reason to think it was a double helix since Watson and Crick. But think about what's going on. If you have a bacterial chromosome, there will be hundreds and hundreds of uh, you know, the two strands of the, that make up the DNA backbone, they're winding around each other in this double helix. Mm -hmm. They're going to be, they're often, they don't have free ends. The ends are often joined together to make a circle. Mm -hmm. So then you have two curves that are very highly linked mm -hmm. 
in this sense. Like that's a linking number of one. Their linking number is like a thousand. Are, that's the point. Their linking number is a thousand. So now think about what happens when the cell has to divide and the two daughter strands have to come apart so that they're open so that you can copy each one. Oh, so assuming that it's not cut at one of the ends and that they stay kind of tied in that loop, you're saying like yes. you can't actually disentangle the two strands. Well, the daughter molecules will be linked 5,000 times oh, also. Yeah. But also even the two separate parental strands cannot disentangle from each other. They can't unlink from each other unless you cut right. them. So biochemists always, of course, they know about this and they say, no, but there must be an enzyme that cuts them. Mm -hmm. We haven't discovered the enzyme yet, but there surely there's some enzyme that does this. Okay, so then a mathematician named Pohl, P-O-H-L, William Pohl at Minnesota said, okay, that sounds plausible, but it can't work because you can't, linking of molecules is a global property. There's no local measurement you can do on a little piece of DNA that will tell you how much it's linked. You'd have to measure the whole molecule. Mm -hmm. And the enzyme is not big enough to make a global measurement of the whole extent of DNA. What's it gonna do, count five, up to 5,000? Mm. So he made a certain mathematical argument that in, in principle, what's happening is that DNA is locally helical, but it has to be both right and left-handed helices oh. <laughs> so that the net, the, net, the net linking number is zero. That... So that in fact, <laughs> they can just unzip and come apart. Right. I, I have to assume that's, that's not at all how it work. actually works though. No, all of that is wrong. <laughs> but but in, in, in 1980, yeah. in 1980, there wasn't clear proof that DNA was a right-handed helix. And actually, around that same year, left-handed DNA was discovered. Oh, that's so interesting. So, so it is possible to have both senses of chirality of DNA. Um, but, you know, all the bio... Anyway, I told Worsell this idea that I have... I've been reading these papers by Pohl, and he argues it's not a double helix. Mm -hmm. And he said, if you write your thesis about that, it will be a laughable matter. Really? That was that was a very vivid memory of that adjective. It will be a laughable matter. So he essentially kicked me out of his office. Man. And <laughs> did you find that discouraging or did you say, well, I got to just come up with No, it. I liked his personality. Yeah. I liked how hot he was yeah. and how decisive he was. And I don't want to embarrass myself. So if it's really going to be laughable, all right. I, look, I'm just a kid. I don't know what I'm doing. Right. I, I mean, he gave me arguments why Paul was wrong and- you know, the experimental evidence that the, the molecules do get tangled with each other. And so he just said, don't oh, get out of here. That's a stupid idea. <laughs> so so I, a few months later, I came back with another idea. And um, he said, that idea is better than the one you came with the last time, but it's still not that good. But if you want a good problem, and then he gave me a certain problem. Hmm. And he said, this is the problem that everybody is breaking their heads on and described a certain problem. And I said, I could do that problem this afternoon. Is it too much to describe he, here what the problem was? No, I can tell you. Please do. He, so, so um, all right, so DNA doesn't just exist floating around in a cell. It's always wound around proteins called nucleosomes that act like spools. Hmm. Like if you wanna store a lot of thread, what do you do? You don't just throw it in a drawer. Yeah. You wind it around a spool where it's very organized. So nature does that too. It takes this enormous length of DNA and winds it around protein spools, which had just been discovered a few years before that time. It was in 1974 they found nucleosomes. So, um, but what was not known is, okay, the DNA was known to wrap like, actually a confusing number, one and three quarters turn around each spool. So what hmm. that means is like, I'll draw with my fingers here. I, I come in, I wrap around a full turn, then I go around three quarters turns and come out at right angles to the way I entered. Bizarre. And then I connect to another nucleus. Think of them as beads. Yeah. They're like beads on a string, on a necklace. And so the DNA winds around, just happens that's what fits one and three quarters turns, then to the next one, one and three quarters. So you have all these like so right have, angles for how it's coming out, fitting together? Yeah, I mean, that's based on X-ray crystallography measurements where everything is frozen and rigid. It's made into a crystal. Mm. And, you know, in real life, it's in the cell and it's, hotter and jiggling around. And so maybe it's not exactly right angles, but but that was a basically the amount of DNA wrapped on the proteins. So, okay, so that was a known fact. But what was not known is how do the different nucleosomes, these different beads, stack in relation to each other to make the next level? Of, I mean, what we're trying to do is build a chromosome, mm -hmm. right? Going from a DNA, which is just DNA, to this mixture of DNA and proteins that makes up all chromosomes, which is where you know, your genes live, 
How do you do that? What's the next level of structure above the DNA double helix and nucleosome combination? So people had measured something called the thick fiber of chromatin, which, you know, under the microscope just looks like something th thick, 300 angstroms across or whatever it is. Not, not that thick, but <laughs> but on a molecular, I mean, it's much thicker than DNA. <laughs> In comparison. Yeah. So they always call it the thick fiber. So what that was the big open question in biology at the time. What's the what's the struct what's the higher order structure of chromatin? What's the structure of the thick fiber? And so Worcell said to me, I have a a model for how the nucleosomes sit in relation to each other. And um, can you calculate the linking number implied by this structure? Hmm. Because people had made a measurement of the linking number and found that it gave an effective linking number of one per nucleosome. And he said that contradicts the one and three quarters turns that each DNA makes around the nucleosome. So how is it that, like, why isn't it one and three quarters times N? Hmm. Why is it only one times N? Why is the linking number one N instead of one and three quarters N? And he said, I think I know why. It's because of the complicated path that DNA takes as it winds around in this model that I've made that I see in the electron microscope. But I don't know how to calculate the linking number of that structure. Hmm. So I said, I could do it this afternoon. And he said, I don't believe it. And I said, I'll, I'll show you. I know how to do it. <laughs> because it was and easy. Did you? Yeah. Oh, it wow. was very easy. Because I had read a paper by Francis Crick, which said you could calculate linking numbers by just taking a piece of ribbon. You could buy ribbon at any dressmaking store. You, you literally get a piece of ribbon. You wind it in the pattern. Right. Then, because it's a topological invariant, you can just lay it flat on the floor. And you won't change the linking number. Is that what Just you like did? You I, take some ribbon yeah, and apply it to I, bought, I went and bought ribbon. I made Worcell structure. I then laid it out flat on the floor and counted the number of twists. That's it. It was experimental math. That's so delightfully, the, yeah, pragmatic. <laughs> because the mathematician's like, oh, what, what can I look at? What invariant will I like use to leverage this problem? Well, Crick had said, because it's invariant, you can distort the structure into something much simpler and then just count that. So, okay, when you're going to write this up as a, you know, undergrad honors thesis, can the write-up say, here's some pictures of me with a piece of ribbon? Well, I did. First, I did it that way, but then I did a math proof. Okay, okay. Once once I knew the answer, then it wasn't that hard to figure out a proof. Oh, that's, okay. So this this seems like an interesting relationship between experimental math and pure math, where experimental yeah. math is to get you the answer. And it's a lot easier to find proofs when you know what the answer is supposed to be. But it's, it's I'll, look, pure mathematicians do that too. They have examples. They, yeah, they sometimes, absolutely. you know, I mean, right, we, we know that. That's, it's not. I wouldn't imply that experimental math is a thing that pure mathematicians don't do. I guess it's more different. Okay, okay. All ah, right. I mean, think of Gauss guessing the prime number theorem from right. the, the uh, maybe apocryphal story, probably a true story, of, of him looking at pri of tables of prime numbers. Anyway, we wrote, that was my first published paper, this paper with Worcell. Oh, wow. And it was in the very big journal, The Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. And the interesting thing was that the department gave me highest honors. They graduated me summa cum laude, even though I was getting Bs in my topology course. Ah. They, they recognized that I, okay, if you let this kid do applied math, right. he can actually do good applied math. Like nobody else was working with the biochemist. I found that guy on my own, I did something very original. What a great lesson about how little grades matter if you're doing original work Fortune, elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, they if you have enlightened teachers, they. I remember my advisor saying to me, why'd you have to get so many Bs? <laughs> like, I had to really argue for you. <laughs> but I couldn't help it. Yeah. I do remember going into my, um, whatever they call it, the exams at the end where they give you oral exams. And I was being asked something about stabilizers and centralizers and something in group theory. And, and and then I couldn't answer and they were giving me hints. And I f just felt like I actually did say, there's don't, you don't even need to give me hints. There's no way I'm going to answer this. Mm. Like, I don't understand this stuff. And I just didn't. I never learned those things properly. And I would love to teach it. I think I could learn it now if I could teach it. Mm. Do you use teaching as a means of learning things? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because then there's a gun to your head. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, <yeah. laughs> right? I mean, you can't. You have to find a way. But then I, there's no time pressure. I can think about it my own way. I can ask for help. It's not cheating, right? There's so many things in school that that make it hard to learn. Mm. Like, yeah, you know, right? Getting help is cheating. That's true. Uh, of course, of course. If you do it on well, that's the question. Are you allowed to collaborate? You should be. 
there should be a good culture of collaboration about problem sets at the very least. Maybe tests, that yeah. can make sense. But any institution that no, doesn't have that. a culture of working together on P-sets feels deeply problematic. Uh-huh. What's the probability we find you teaching a group theory course in the future? <laughs> well, it's pretty close to zero because <laughs> we have um, lots of colleagues who are real experts in it who will be teaching it. But, but are they expert teachers? Yeah, I don't know. I could ask. I would like to teach it. Oh, the world! I would, would like love to that. learn it and teach it. I mean, honestly, the fact that you you weren't the student who was nailing the question about stabilizers in your oral exams might actually put you in a better position to teach it empathetically, because I think so. It's. I mean, it's like a lot of fields out there where once you're bought into why it matters and what the whole framework is, then you just think about it a certain way. But so many students have that feeling with a group theory class of, wow, I thought this was supposed to be like what mathematicians care about and people keep telling me it's beautiful but that is not the feeling i have when i'm trying to you know prove this little lemma well i did have this experience fairly recently with um real analysis which was another hmm. one of my um a hurdle that i didn't clear in, in undergraduate days so i did volunteer to teach a real analysis course but we have two flavors of it so there's the one for future math graduate students, which I didn't volunteer to teach. And then there's one for people who want to learn real analysis, but are going to do math and physics or math and biology or computer science or economics. So that's, you know, it would be regarded as the easier one, Mm -hmm. but it's still real analysis. And so I volunteered to teach that knowing that I didn't understand real analysis at the time I began the course. And Uh, I used an interesting book by David Brasseau called A Radical Approach to Real Analysis. Hmm. And so David Brasseau is an excellent teacher at McAllister, a small college, liberal arts college in Minnesota. And his approach is radical in the sense that radical means from the roots of the subject, Hmm. right? That's what a radical is, is a root. Hmm. Like when you eradicate something, you rip it out by the roots. I've never really thought about that etymology. Wow. That's why we call them radicals for square roots. They're, Never ra- they're about roots. That. My God. <laughs> That's it. To eradicate is to rip something out by the roots. I love words. So his book is a pun. His title, A Radical Approach to Real Analysis, is what if you go back to the roots? Yeah. Why did people invent notions like uniform convergence? Yeah. There's a very good reason. So, And also because I like history. I taught the course from Brasseau's book using history. We did things in the order that they were historically discovered, mm. which is extremely motivating because you care, you love the questions because they were real problems. Yeah. Basically, the, the short version of it is that when Fourier invented his, his way of doing Fourier series, it posed a lot of difficulties for the, you know, because he was doing infinite sums of functions and like, does this really converge? How can you take continuous sine waves and make discontinuous square waves out of them? Yeah. So Fourier created a lot of trouble, and that's what caused real analysis to happen. Mm. A lot of people think real analysis is a reaction to Newton and Leibniz using infinitesimals. That's not, that was not a problem. That didn't cause any trouble. I actually wanted to talk about this today a little bit, so maybe we should dive in, like the, the history of calculus and, one, how that could play into how we should teach calculus, because so many people have a bad experience with it. But also, you've recently written a book meant to popularize the subject. I didn't really realize this, that infinitesimals weren't an issue, that the mathematical community was all right with that. They're not everybody. (laughs) I mean, there was a famous guy named Bishop Barclay who wrote a very scathing attack on Newton for um, his, you know, ghosts of departed quantities, as they were called. Well, backing up a little bit, I don't have a good conception, and you know the history much better than I do. How was Newton thinking about, like, if, I guess he wasn't writing DF and DX, that was like a Leibniz um, That's Leibniz, yeah. But was he thinking about infinitesimals in the, in a literal sense of I'm adding this infinitely small quantity? Was he thinking of that as a metaphor for something else? Uh, do you have any sense of... He, he wrestled with it a lot, as far as I can tell. I, I'm not a historian either, um, so I don't trust that what I'm going to tell you is exactly right. But it, it looks to me like from there are times when he's thinking about infinitesimals. Mm-hmm. Um, he sometimes writes a little O which I think is supposed to remind him of a zero. Hmm. It's not quite zero, but it's almost a zero. It's a little O. Right. And he'll add little O to something, and he treats it like an infinitesimal, like it, like the way Leibniz would use a dx. Um, so Newton sometimes plays with infinitesimals, but he seems to have distrusted them. 
And so then he comes to the idea that he needs ratios of infinitesimals. That that gives him finite results mm -hmm. and um, non-zero results. And so he, well, it could be zero, but but anyway, he looks at ratios of infinitesimals and he thinks of those as like velocities. Mm -hmm. You know, that a ratio change in y over a change in t or something like that. So it's like a velocity of a particle with a position y of t. Uh, and so he calls these things fluxions. You know, things, the fluxions are, he, he, for him, calculus is at first very much about motion. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting when you read him, which I have now a lot, he has three ways of doing calculus and they come at different times in his life. First, he uses infinite series, hmm. power series. You know, that's where he comes in as a student. He kind of invents what we think of as Taylor series and McLaurin series. He's doing all of that, that he gets from, from Wallace, who has used ideas about infinity. Hmm. And Wallace wrote a book that Newton studied very carefully as a student. And so he's, he's at first very inspired by Wallace and by the importing of the idea of decimal numbers from, from India. Hmm. You know, we think of as Hindu-Arabic numbers. But decimals were not that well, you know, known at that time. And decimals basically represent real numbers as infinite series of numbers. Right. You know, right? It's how many powers of one-tenth, how many of one one-hundred. Wait, so in that time, was everyone doing their math with fractions? There was a lot of use of fractions. Hmm. Um, like if someone wanted to think about pi, how would they think about what pi is? Well, um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I don't... Decimals had been around for a while in, in Europe. So it's I, I may be garbling this a little bit. I mean, certainly people were using logarithms, so they were working mm. with decimals. So, I, you know, I'm probably exaggerating. It's just that... But really that thinking new, of it as like a power series. It is a power yeah. series in powers of 10 or inverse powers of 10. And Newton thought to himself, why can't I do the same thing with a symbol X mm. and have powers of a symbol X? And then it sort of acts like a decimal. So he, he did a lot of manipulations with infinite series, didn't think about convergence too much, but I'm sure he he knew what the issue was because he was calculating things. So he would check that he was getting good convergence in a practical sense. Mm -hmm. Was he getting good answers? Um, I mean, he sometimes would work to 50 digits. That's he's, insane. He's really, <laughs> you can see it in his notebooks. It's wild. He calculates log of, you know, like 1.01 to many, many, about 50 digits. Man. Um, <laughs> But anyway, so so he first he uses infinite series. Later he uses fluxions, these ratios of infinitesimals that are like velocities. And then later he doesn't use any of that, and he uses his geometric version of calculus, which is what he wrote the Principia in, hmm. where he's he's essentially using geometry, but he has notions of like triangles that are shrinking to slivers that become. He doesn't call them infinitesimal triangles, but he's he's using a geometric version of calculus. But is he thinking in terms of at all steps, there's a finite thing and we're doing some kind of limiting approach? Or would he have not even framed it in terms of... I'm not limit? sure. I, I think mm. so. I mean, because when he talks about fluxions anyway, he says, like if he thinks of a ratio of what we would say, like a delta y over a delta x, as they both become close to zero, he says, you don't think about them before they're zero. You think of them at the moment they vanish. <laughs> right. Don't think of them before they vanish or after they vanish. Think of them precisely when they vanish. It's funny. I Do you feel like that, if you're teaching a student, would you frame it to them that way? Or is that No, a, it's va very vague. Yeah, I don't yeah, like it's, it. It's a thing that you have to evolve past. I, <laughs> I don't like it, but that's his, that was his best attempt at the time. Hmm. So anyway, I don't think that calculus, that version of calculus posed much trouble for people. Because they were actually solving astronomical problems and didn't really bother them that... Well, what paradoxes do you get into? I mean, differential calculus doesn't lead to a lot of trouble. If you, it, like, where do you really go wrong? You, you really don't, there are, you could make up some cockeyed examples. There were things that people worried about, like the, the infinite series one minus one plus one minus one. Right. Alternating. Okay, that thing, which we would today say doesn't converge because it alternates between, two, it's partial sums bounce between one and zero. Um that was still a live question in the early 1700s after Newton was more or less done doing math. Hmm. People were arguing, does that converge to one? I mean, they wouldn't have said converge. They would say, what is the sum? Right. Is the sum one? Is it zero or is it a half? Because there was a good reason to think the sum was a half. And we have like formal notions there of are how, notions where it should with be the right half. notions of convergence. Yeah. Right. 
So, so people, good mathematicians were arguing about that. Should, but those were the pathologies, and it wasn't really where like serious inventors of calculus. Yeah, it wasn't. Were. It wasn't a big deal for the most part. Hmm. Whereas Fourier series really caused problems that had to be dealt with and couldn't be swept under the rug, as far as I can see, because they were using hmm. them to solve the wave equation, and they were getting physical answer the heat equation. So yeah. there was a lot at stake in making sense of those. Uh, anyway, I don't know. I mean, that part of math is interesting. And I, I love teaching that course, that historical version of real analysis. How did the students like it? I don't think that uh, all of them liked it. I know, I remember I used to resent history when my teachers would do history, hmm. actually. Like, especially I remember my quantum mechanics teacher spending a long time on the history of the early days of quantum mechanics. And I thought, get uh, I want to learn about Schrodinger and Heisenberg. I don't want to read all this junky stuff that we don't use anymore. That's interesting because you, I mean, <laughs> earlier you were talking about how you found yourself, you know, reading about the Schrodingers and the Einsteins and Bohr. Was it, was it the history of them that was intriguing you or was it the strange bit of reality that they were exposing? I, I mean, I realize what I'm saying probably sounds very contradictory. A little. It but... does. I, I hear it. I hear it myself. <laughs> history is very confusing. That's the trouble. Yeah. When you learn how things were really discovered, it's often very illogical and therefore very confusing. Do you, so, I mean, it's an interesting question. How much should we emphasize the history of things in an initial course? You, it runs the risk of distracting. It's very distracting but, in some ways. I know it's a hard problem. It's hard to be a good teacher. I, I don't actually remember much in the um, Chaos and Nonlinear Dynamics lectures. Do you talk about the historical development of this stuff well, that much? Um, I have a, a, like a chapter zero or something or a, ch a first chapter where I try to give what I consider a historical overview of the subject and a logical overview. And they're very mm. different. You know, this is the logical structure of what we're going to learn all semester. This is actually how it came about and it's not at all the way it looks mm. logically. So I, I do present both. But if I were teaching the course, I would only spend the first half of the first lecture on that. But then later in the course, when I'm talking about Lorenz's equations, I would tell you what Lorenz did and why he was interested in those equations, where they came from, what question he was asking. So I, I don't feel like I want to be a slave to history, but where it is motivating and helpful, I'm happy to discuss it. Um, but man, I got a lot of respect. I mean, I got a lot, I just was going to say, I got a lot of respect for the historians in researching infinite powers. Mm. Like... You, you probably are aware that when we our math professors or our physics professors talk about history, they often repeat a lot of mythology, a lot of folklore. Yes, that's such a good word for it. There's folklore. There's stand, like the folklore around Galois or yeah, something. You have these that. standard stories that uh, if you dig into them a little bit uh, – are very not necessarily well fact checked. And I don't know if that makes it a problem necessarily. It's a really interesting question. Is it a problem? This, we we could frame them as fables, like these are the math history fables. fables. <laughs> they're fables. They they often are very good fables, um, and you should be very skeptical of them. Does any pop into your mind right now as a, a classic fable that the physics teachers or mathematicians were passing down that you later learned has no bearing in reality? Well, okay, one of them is the story of Archimedes being the do not disturb my circles fable. Do you know this story? Uh, tell me more. I don't. I don't tell it. So Archimedes was murdered in the battle of, for his town. There was a siege. The Romans put a siege on his home of Syracuse. Hmm. So Syracuse on an island on Sicily um, was being attacked by the Roman Empire. And Archimedes, according to legend, you know, we were told by Plutarch and other historians that Archimedes made fantastic war engines, they were called, which were like catapults and big parabolic mirrors to set the you know, catch, make the uh, the sails of the incoming boats catch on fire by focusing a beam of light on them. Sounds pretty fantastical. Like, really? Is that really possible to yeah. do that? How would you even um, manufacture you, mirrors like that? <laughs> how would you get a mirror that good? How big would it have to be? Um, there's a story in Plutarch about Archimedes making a crane that could lift the ships out of the water and shake the soldiers out of them, <laughs> you know, and so on like that. So, so you have to think, come on, this, yeah. is this really true? But, but the story is that at the end of the battle, the end of the siege, when the, the town was taken, um, there was a Roman soldier sent to get Archimedes and bring him back to the general, to Marcellus, 
who wanted Archimedes, like he would be valuable. And so he was not supposed to be killed. He was supposed to be taken alive and brought back, according to these stories. But according to the legend, Archimedes was doing a geometry problem in the sand that involved some elaborate construction with circles. Mm. And the soldier who's coming up from behind him steps in the sand and disturbs the circles with his foot. And Archimedes says, don't disturb my circles. And gets killed on the spot. You know, the soldier stabs him and kills him on the spot. So, so what part of that is true? We know that Archimedes died in the Battle of Syracuse. Did he die because a lot of people died for various reasons? Maybe. Mm. We don't really know. Was it true that the general wanted him captured alive? Maybe. But how do we know that Archimedes said, do not disturb my circles? Who would have reported that? Right. Would the soldier have said that? Right. Um, so that's been traced. I mean, that has been looked at by uh, Alberto Martinez. So Alberto Martinez is a historian of science at UT Austin. And he wrote some really nice books. One is called The Cult of Pythagoras. And um, there's another one with science in the title. I'm, I maybe called like Science Secrets or something like that. But anyway, Cult of Pythagoras is a debunking of many of these myths. Hmm. And one of them is this story. And he traces back through the historical record, which historians wrote what about Archimedes? Where did this story come from? And it's interesting. Like, you know, Plutarch is not telling that story. Mm. He doesn't have anything about what the soldier said. But everybody who tells these great stories feels the need to make the story. Like, I probably just did now. Yeah, I probably, it's, it's like the story. soldier kicks it with his sandal, you know. Yeah. I don't know what he did. Maybe he did. <laughs> <laughs> the whole story is baloney. He, it's all made up. <laughs> right. Because some guy at some point made this embellishment, and now we keep telling it because it's such a good story. <laughs> On, well, I, I have to ask, in the cult of Pythagoras, since the story about the person showing that the square root of two is irrational getting thrown off of a boat. That's another interesting one. That one is also discussed in there. And and what's the resolution there? There is some discussion of a particular person named Hipparchus, who is the one, if anybody was thrown overboard at sea for discovering it, it's Hipparchus. So, but was he? It doesn't seem to be the case. I mean, a lot of, remember, Pythagoras is very old. This is 500 BC right. that Pythagoras lives. And the first people really writing down anything about Pythagoras is close to a, a thousand years later. That's such a I mean, wild it's a long time. gap. It's a thousand years later. Okay. Yeah. That's a real, <laughs> it's not even a hundred years later. It's a really long time. We don't have records from 400 BC or 300. It's very long before anybody's telling stories. I mean, Cicero wrote some stuff. Well, in that case, how did people even know about Pythagoras? Well, he had disciples. Was it an oral tradition from those disciples? Yes. Okay. Yes, there's a school, the Pythagoreans, they really existed. The Pythagoreans existed. Some people doubt that there is a real Pythagoras. like Because Pythagoras was imbued with a lot of godlike powers. He, mm. he really was some kind of religious figure, it seems. The Pythagoreans, there were various Pythagoreans who have left us documents. Hmm. So, okay. so there are people um, who wrote about Pythagoras, uh, you know, like a few hundred years later. Hmm. But, um, and that's a whole interesting part of, you know, pre-Socratic Greek scholarship. I mean, the idea that he might not have been real is insane. Well, that's what they say about Shakespeare too, right? Or Shakespeare was someone else or Homer didn't really exist. Right, right. Or, I mean, it's, yeah. So it's unclear that there really was a Pythagoras, but, you know, we're told, yes, he came from this certain island off the coast of Turkey and blah, 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 blah. So there's a standard tradition of who Pythagoras was. I don't know. Maybe he really did exist, but um, was he a good mathematician? Did he, you know, I don't know. I, when you read Al Martinez and others, it seems like there's a you can't trust much of what you read about Pythagoras. Interesting. What are what are some of the other like interesting things that you found while researching infinite powers uh, about the history of calculus that you didn't know before, but maybe shaped how you think about the whole field now? Well, I didn't know that Fermat and Descartes had such a big fight. Hmm. Uh, you always hear about Newton and Leibniz having a big fight, and even that, I think, is not told correctly. As far as I can tell, Leibniz really admired Newton. Oh, really? And he approached him, I think, in very good, well, they were competitive. But, I mean, Newton was very uh, very narrow compared to Leibniz. 
Leibniz thought about everything. That mm. guy was a real genius in a very broad sense. Whereas Newton, okay, yes, great at physics and math. He also did some stuff that we consider a little bit flaky today. Um, alchemy. It, and... You know, da- the dates, alchemy, the dating stuff in the Bible. And he was pretty religious in certain ways. And I think he had probably had a certain amount of mental illness. He had some breakdowns and, and things. But, but Leibniz was fairly new to math. I mean, Leibniz was not devoted. Well, Newton also just got, got really strong at math in college. But, but Leibniz was qu- a latecomer. He had Christian, Christian Huygens helping him learn the basics. Hmm. Who, and Huygens was probably, I mean, Newton referred to Huygens as sumus huganius. You know, like he was the highest. Hmm. He's only, he was the only person that I think Newton really admired as a, almost an equal. So we don't hear much about Christian Huygens anymore, but Newton thought of him as, you know, that guy had game. <laughs> Whereas Leibniz, I think he thought of like kind of just an annoying gnat, you know. This Mr. dilettante polymath. <laughs> yeah, he's a dilettante polymath. He, and you can see it in the letters they write to each hmm. other. Leibniz writes letters that don't go directly to Newton, but they go through an intermediary to be given to Mr. Newton. And, and those letters are really interesting. We do have those letters back and forth between them. And he's kind of supplicating, like he really wants Newton to tell him some of his tricks. Hmm. And, and Newton doesn't want to play ball at all. So at first, he's very sarcastic and withholding. And all he does is send super impressive results that like, this shows you how much better I am than you. You're never going to understand how I got this. And he doesn't mm. explain how. But but Leibniz is not really scared. And and Leibniz says, I would like more explanation of this. Could you show me how you did this or that? And then Newton kind of changes his tune and is very almost sweet and pedagogical. Hmm. And he, he gives a very gentle explanation, some of which I t- quote in the book. Actually, some of them were too mathematical, so my editor didn't let me put them in the book. But I could give you a PDF, which you could post. Oh, please do. Yeah, this, yeah, uh, yeah. Let's throw it in the show notes. That sounds great. Yeah, because Newton really does explain things very well. Um, and it's fun to see him in teacher mode. He could teach. He could explain very well when he wanted to. That is very different than the usual caricatures we, we see of this like fierce battle between them or of, or yeah. of Newton being kind of a jerk uh, to a lot of the people. He, that Well, he was in some ways. So when, when, when Leibniz sends him something to try to impress Newton, mm-hmm. you know, a certain infinite series that he, he's proud of, that he's figured out how to sum it, Newton says something like, you can't imagine what pleasure it has given me to see this series that I've already found, you know, three other ways to do. <laughs> I had no idea there was a fourth way. <laughs> so, oh, you know, he's he has a way of being polite, but sort of like, sorry, not sorry. And he's got to you know, flex he's, a little he's bit. He's kind of passive aggressive. Yeah, he's flexing. So uh, he's he's not a very easy guy. I think I would have liked Leibniz. Everything I read about Leibniz, he seems funny. He seems like a real person. Well, it sounds like he had an insane number of correspondences and was this like academic social butterfly of the era. Yeah. And you have to imagine you're at least a little bit likable to keep that up. Although he says of himself, he's very self-deprecating. He says that he's not likable. He says that he always makes a bad impression. Oh, the fact that he's even thinking on those terms tells you that he's... <laughs> he's a good guy, yeah. right? <laughs> he is. He's very self-deprecating. He talks about how ugly he is and what a bad impression he makes and... Um, huh. yeah, I, I really think I would have liked him now. So you have to keep in mind too, that historians hate this whole thing we're doing right now. They, they, my friends that in history of science that I've met through Twitter and, you know, like they would say, so I'm thinking of Michael Barony, for instance, he would say, you don't know what Leibniz was really mm. like. That's, that would take a lot of historical work to figure out. And um, you pretend when you think you understand what Archimedes was like, because I really feel very emotional about Archimedes. He comes across, I think, in the book as the guy I love the most. This, I mean, this did shine through how there's a high respect for just how sophisticated his math was. Oh, yeah. But I don't know, but I, I feel more emotional about it than that because Archimedes lets you in. Hmm. He tells you that he he hopes that what he does will help mathematicians in the future find theorems, he says, that have not yet fallen to our share. Hmm. Meaning the things that I haven't figured out, I hope you'll figure them out. Hmm. He, he has a wistfulness to him. You know, and again, you could say, no, that's bull. I'm not, I'm just making that up. Well, he wrote those words. I mean, 
okay, maybe they've been mistranslated, but I don't see any reason to believe that. And honestly, um, even if there is a uh, little bit of color dye of fiction that has leaked its way into the history that gets us there, if if there's something humanizing about the person almost inventing calculus in the BC times, or if there's something humanizing mm-hmm. about Leibniz, it cuts to what we were talking about earlier, where I don't know if it's a problem. I mean, the historians will maybe roll their eyes a little bit, but for the sake of getting someone you know, engaged with the subject material and putting themselves in the position of an inventor of it and all that. I, (laughs) you know, I don't know if the historical stickler is necessarily adding to that goal. That's, see, that's interesting. We have different aims. I like the way you phrase it. That if you're a historian, you want the truth. You want to get as close as you can. Well, I mean, that'd be, I suppose some historians would say we can't know the truth. There's only, yeah. you know, different accounts, whatever. But but for those who believe there is a truth, then we should try to figure out what it was historically um, or approximately as guess, the best we can. Uh, that's one aim, to get to the truth. But another is to teach and to inspire. Yeah. And it's interesting that you say that in the service of teaching, maybe pretending that we can think of Archimedes as a colleague, as like a big brother for us. I don't want to insinuate um, that we shouldn't care about the truth either. Like exactly what we were saying before about framing it honestly as folklore, but then just embracing the folklore. Say, who knows what <laughs> Leibniz was like? Maybe he was like this. We don't know for sure. But let me talk a little bit about what that dinner party would look like now. Yeah. Because it's not completely unknown. The ones that are closer to us did leave records, and we have them. Right. You know, it's very different with Archimedes, where his stuff it was, is written in Greek, and then um, the library at Alexandria gets sacked, and a lot of stuff gets burned, and then it has to make its way across to Constantinople and all this. I mean, there's real adventure stories in these documents. Yeah. We you see, like, unlike Euclid, where every little school child has to learn Euclid, you know, that's basic geometry. Actually, the truth is Euclid is pretty deep too. Mm. But but there's a bastardized version of Euclid that we think of as like elementary plane geometry. Euclid actually has 13 books, but we focus mostly on the plane geometry part of Euclid. Anyway, Euclid is, is copied, they say, more than any other book in Western tradition except the Bible. Mm. So, so Euclid um, is very well reproduced, but Archimedes was hard. And so there was very little motivation to keep copying Archimedes. And so most of his stuff is lost. I mean, we know because other people refer to this or that book by Archimedes. We don't have the book. We don't know what he did in that book. We only know secondhand. But we have some actual Archimedes that have been discovered. And so that's one of the stories that I tell in in Infinite Powers is um, his book about the method Mm -hmm. where he figures out volumes and areas by imagining shapes as being made of material, and he weighs them in his mind using his law of the lever. It's incredibly ingenious and yet never something we would teach anymore. And it's also, I mean, what surprised me so much is how much it looks like calculus, that he's slicing things up and thinking of, you've got oh, yeah. this hard to understand shape. What are all the, the you know, the areas and masses of the slices? Along he the totally way? understands calculus. Absolutely. It was wild. And that's his two millennia before. <laughs> yeah. No, he's really incredibly good. I think he's one of the best ever, uh, you know, with Newton and Euler and Gauss. I mean, Archimedes is totally in the first rank. Hmm. Yeah, he's really special. Tell me about Fourier as a personality. I don't know so much about Fourier. They always say that he was never, he was cold. Ironic for the man studying the heat equation. Right. He was cold. He would wear a heavy coat even in the summer. Oh, literally cold, not as a personality. He was literally cold. Oh, he was okay. always cold. <laughs> he was always dressed in a heavy coat, Some one of his correspondents says. <laughs> so he's staying there in his jacket. I really need to understand heat. <laughs> He's <laughs> thinking about temperature much more than the rest of us are. and has this itch to solve that problem. <laughs> so when you're thinking about all of these different things, incorporating the history into teaching, thinking of your own undergrad experience with some of the axiomatic approaches, the fact that you wanted to be a teacher since you were little, if you were mentoring someone on exposition right now, you know, they tell you either they want to be a teacher or uh, they're going to put up some online explainer, or um, it's someone who's a colleague of yours about to teach, you know, they're about to teach a calculus class. Um, What are the things that you feel like you've kind of learned really work well that wouldn't have been obvious to you when you were just starting off? About exposition. About exposition, yeah. I'll give you an example. I feel like often if I write something down, 
Um, once I understand the material well, I have this tendency to start with the generalizations. And here's this really powerful general tool, right? And then maybe yeah. as this side note at the end, you give some examples of how you apply it. But invariably, it's better if you let those examples motivate the generalization. And you kind of, in the same way that like understanding the, the commutative nature of uh, multiplication, you thinking of nine times two very directly, oh, I need to add up two nine different times, or I need to add up <laughs> nine two different times. That is this very concrete example that leads your mind to want commutativity to be a thing and maybe to better understand mm -hmm. multiplication along the way. And I feel like that happens at all levels. You know, you don't just start talking about the axioms of a group. You talk about different symmetries and maybe wanting to ask certain questions of them. Like I imagine actually maybe there's probably a path to understanding group theory where you start just, you lead up to the proof of the unsolvability of the quintic where you are, are sh shuffling roots around of a polynomial. And you actually need to ask a concrete question about um, the nature of those symmetries. And this is a very long-winded way of saying a principle that I think has emerged is try to put the concrete before the abstract. Um, mm -hmm. And that it, it's, it's worth actually having that in the forefront of the mind as an author because once you understand something, the tendency is to go the other way around. And so it's not enough to like nod your head and acknowledge like, yes, motivating examples are good. That something about our un instincts upon understanding it lead us to do things wrong the first way. Um, and it also seems like a lot of math exposition culture, I don't want to say it's got a disease, but there is something going on with math exposition where seminars tend to lose people in math more than they seem to in computer science and physics. Um, or this experience that you had as an undergrad of, uh, liking the subject a lot enough to even push through with it a lot more than other others would have but facing that friction that you know I, I get the impression that doesn't happen in other fields as much so there's something going wrong in typical math exposition and i'm an optimist mm -hmm. that it can be cured in some way mm -hmm. and the lessons learned from the people who have become best at it and you are definitely one of the best at it if we look at not just the courses you've taught but the popular books that you've done or your contributions to the new york times and everything like that undoubtedly there is some seeds of wisdom that we can try to unearth that <laughs> that it's, it's well, tr you, transmissible right it's 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 presumably a teachable skill or or a a malleable culture um that if we actually wanted math exposition to be better you know 20 years from now what are those seeds uh -huh. that you start planting in the people who will go into that well yeah so i uh, of course i don't have any um, monopoly on this, but there are great math writers. I think it would help to look for good role models. Hmm. Now, what are those <laughs> or who are those? I mean, there's a lot of negative role models. I think that's part of the problem that I think there is a collective taste that pervades the culture of, of pure math is what I want to say, but I don't feel totally qualified to say that because I don't really read much pure math. I've read a lot of math textbooks that are pure math textbooks, but I don't read pure math journals by and large. Um, but I think there is a culture that prizes elegance and concision, hmm. that it's good to be brief. It's good to be, and elegance is often associated with minimal, you know, use of words. Tighter arguments are better than longer arguments, that kind of thing. Uh, a lot of those seem to me anti-psychological, like they, they treat a human being as something that is not what a human being is, mm. that they don't make allowance for a human the way that people learn or get excited. Oh, there's such a good example of that that comes to mind while you're talking. There's oh, this, go ahead. It's actually a really elegant proof of the fact that you, you're wondering which prime numbers can be decomposed into the sum of two squares. And, you know, so okay. like five can be written as one plus four, but seven, there's no way to write it as a sum of two squares. Um, uh -huh. And... It is a, a useful fact in number theory that it's all of the primes that are one above a multiple of four. But it's a tricky oh, really? little thing to prove. Yeah, no, it's, it's this okay. wonderful, wonderful little fact. Um, and, and then you can use this to do things. You can get to Leibniz formula for pi, for example, by leveraging this fact about primes in a way that seems uh -huh. unexpected. This sounds good. Oh, I don't funny. know any of this story. Um, oh, yeah, no, it's, it's such a wonderful like, story there. It's not how Leibniz found it by any means. There's much easier ways to prove Leibniz formula if you just throw a little bit of calculus at it. But this, you know, sure. one minus one third plus one fifth on and on that it equals pi fourths, like has this um, shadow of primes inside it. But that little fact, um, it's a little tricky to prove, but there's this very famous uh, one sentence proof of it. And it was published as like a one sentence proof that is absolutely inscrutable. There is no <laughs> one who can... I, Maybe somebody with the like 
preset deep intuitions of number theory could read it and maybe understand where it came from. But it's this absolutely out of the blue function that's been defined as this like involution. And you say, because it's an involution, yada, yada, this will only work if the prime is one mod four. Um, and the concision of it is the elegance, but I, I cannot think of a worse proof of that fact in terms of intuition. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, it's, so, I mean, this is the extreme that maybe illustrates the point that you're making about how what is rewarded as elegance or what is lauded as a, you know, and that one might be a strange, no one would call that a great proof, but there is something great about it. And there is something uh, almost like prize worthy about being able to do it in a sentence. Yes. Right. There's something charming about that, but, but I, it, it's a very nice example because I think it's an example of uh, boneheaded aesthetics. Mm -hmm. it's, that's the problem. It's, it's just, I mean, as from a pedagogical standpoint, right. maybe to a master, sure. Once you understand the subject, you would be charmed by what a beautiful, clean little argument that is, if you're familiar with that involution that comes into the problem or something. But... Um, Let's talk about someone who's great. Euler actually is a great teacher. So there's an example that has to do with, um, since you're talking about prime numbers, Euler has a formula for the zeta function mm. um, in terms of an infinite product. All the prime numbers actually appear in this infinite product. And uh, the proof of this formula linking the zeta function to this infinite product there's a very nice version of that proof that's given in the book Prime Obsession by John Derbyshire, which he says is essentially Euler's proof, but it's not the proof you would find in any textbook. I can try to say it. It'd be better if I could write it out in words, <laughs> write it in symbols Great. here for you. But should I try to Such just say Such a challenge it? for a podcast, but I'd love to see how you <laughs> Let me try take saying it and challenge. maybe you can animate it somewhere. If you, uh, Maybe you already know it, or maybe you have even done a, a video of it. But so, so let's see. So we're writing an expression that looks like 1 over 1 to the s mm -hmm. plus 1 over 2 to the s plus 1 over 3 to the s, mm -hmm. right? That's the zeta function of s. And then um, Euler says, so call that thing zeta of s. I don't really know what Euler said, but in Derbyshire's recounting, it's something like this. Let me see if I can remember how to do it. Then what we're going to try to do is a trick that is called the sieve of Eratosthenes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's this trick for how to find prime numbers. So I could like I could take this whole series and multiply it by the right thing, which in this case, what should I do? Maybe multiply it by one over two to the s times zeta or something like that. If I do that term by term, mm -hmm. I'll knock out the one over two to the s term, the one over four to the s term, the one over six to the s term. Yeah. Like, did I do that right? Well, if you take a copy of that series and you multiply it by the twos and then you subtract off that copy from the original. Right, then I will have knocked out all of those. So if you multiply it by one minus one over two to the S, like that as yeah. an expression. Uh, again, outstanding podcast material here, but yeah. Well, sorry, but <laughs> no, you no, have it in good. your head. Are you? Do you know this argument that I'm I, giving? I think, I, I, think I, I know the one that you're... Or you can picture it. Basically, it's the same. So, I mean, in the case of Eratosthenes, his move is if I want to find prime numbers, first I knock out all the things that are multiples of two. Mm -hmm. So I knock out two, four, six. Those can't be prime because they're all multiples of two. Mm -hmm. It's a sieve because it's like those numbers have fallen through the sieve into the bucket. Yeah. Then I do it with all the multiples of three. So now three is gone. Six is already gone because mm -hmm. it was gone in the last round. Now nine is gone and so on. So all these numbers are dropping down. And, and as they all drop down, eventually I'm left with just prime numbers. And the don't. genius of Euler was he was able to take that process, which is very visceral to describe, like metaphorically and, and visibly, but make it a, an algebraic process and do this he sort does, of algebraic. And he does, system. and gives him his golden product formula, his his Euler product. But but the thing that's cool is that that is such a very understandable proof. Now it involves working with infinite series mm -hmm. in a way that's considered not kosher right. by the purest of the pure. So we don't teach it that way. Right. But it's very clear. The proof is so clear when you do it that way. <laughs> You see where the formula comes from. You see why anyone would discover it. Well, it's the it's the mathematical equivalent of you playing with your ribbon for the undergrad result, where you yes, first figure out what's true, and then when you need to make it rigorous, that's that's a second step. But just into like, what do you want to be true? That should be treated as a a step worth highlighting and holding up as just as valuable as the rigorous follow. Exactly. Exactly. And you know who did this? Archimedes. Hmm. If you, so I give an example. 
in the book of Archimedes trying to weigh a parabola to figure out the area under a parabola. And he first does an argument that he says is not really a proof, but it's, in, it's analogous to what Euler did. It shows you, more, like in math, we use this ad, is it adverb or adjective, morally. We say it's morally mm. true. It should be true. That, oh, that's actually worth having as one of the principles, I think, like asking what the moral truth of something is. Yes. Because almost always, if you, oh, I, I actually remember on Twitter, like a couple months ago, someone, they just asked about group theory, what morally is a, sub, uh, a normal subgroup, right? And they, yeah. they put that word morally in there. And just with that one adverb, the quality of responses, outstanding. Just That's absolutely the thing. outstanding. We, isn't that interesting? Yeah. We got to give each other permission to give the moral argument. Yeah. Now, maybe you should say, or I, one of us should say, what do we mean by that for anyone who doesn't know what <laughs> right. we're it's talking sort of about? It's strange. Yeah, someone outside of math, like, what? why are you bringing ethics into this? Um, <laughs> but I mean, it's the answer to the should, right? Like, wh why yeah. should something be true? Or like, what? Sure, you've got this rigorous definition of like a normal subgroup, but what intuition is it trying to capture? Uh, That's right. You know, what, what's the way that you would describe it without those sorts of formalisms? And so like lots of pictures are drawn, lots of motivating examples are given in the kind of threads that follow there. Or, or in the case of like Euler's product, you have a moral truth based on what you can do algebraically without worrying about the infinities and the real analysis. And so it's not... Yeah, I don't know. I guess it's in the same way that moral is contrasted with um, exact in other sorts of philosophy, like the difference between ethical philosophy and natural philosophy. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm guessing, uh -huh. right? I'm guessing this is why we came to I don't know, I don't know why word, we say morally. Right, but it's like you've got that sort of contrast between the, the is and the ought. And like math is, is, it's, it's very, like that. This, yeah, it's very... It's what ought to be true. It's this is how things ought to work. Mm -hmm. If things were good, if there were justice in the world, this is how it would work. Yeah. And sometimes there are annoying caveats or little paradoxes. Sometimes what's morally true is not <laughs> actually true. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. So I think giving ourselves permission to show those things that are morally true, they give, it's again, this is what I said earlier. I think intuition is the number one hmm. ingredient in being helpful. So for some reason, I, I want to blame Gauss. I don't know if it's correct historically, but I often hear people say that Gauss was rigorous at a level beyond that of his predecessors. Mm. And that I, I think Gauss, or maybe it's we should blame it on Cauchy or Weierstrass or somebody, the champions of rigor gave us this culture that you then start to see, you know, like in the Bourbaki era where it becomes a super abstract version of rigor. But rigor is the be all and end all. Mm -hmm. And this more intuitive side, the morally speaking side, often the visual side, these things are taken to be somehow soft or like we're embarrassed by them. Mm. You know, we're not hard ass if we show those sides of math. And to me, it's really just stupid because anyone who is a mathematician knows that you have to operate with both parts of your brain. Mm. You do the examples, the intuition, the moral part, then you want to tighten it up and make it math. You want to have a rigorous theorem if you can, because then it will be true for all time. One analogy that comes to mind is um it's a little bit as if the final output of math is like the machine code from a program that the way that we like ought to teach it is more like the source code or even better the comments around that source code and that there's there's rewards for the machine code output but there seem to be i mean the rewards for good exposition are there right like people are recognized for it but it, it's not necessarily how you're measured up as a as a researcher or an academic in the same ways and maybe do you think that plays that, into it, like the incentives? That is part of it, yes. Yes, the incentive structure is that, you're, you know, it's not done until it's a proof. We give the credit to the person who has the proof, even though somebody else may have opened up the whole subject with their ideas. So, yeah, there may be something about the incentive structure, but I think it's a lot of brainwashing. I think it's that you're told this is, you read a lot of papers as a grad student, and they sound a certain way. They begin, you know, let G be a finite dimensional, blah, blah, blah. And that's like, that's not motivation. Mm -hmm. Why would I let G be that? Why am I even doing this? Yeah. So that's our culture is screwed up. And it's not because our subject is hard that it has to be that way. Because theoretical physics is hard too. But if you go to a theoretical physics colloquium, they will always begin with a story of why this is a cool problem and who worked on it and what it's all about. So they have a different culture that I think is much healthier in terms of exposition. Hmm. Like you can really understand the first 15 minutes of any physics colloquium. Now, maybe after that, it gets hard. 
But in math, I can barely understand usually the first two minutes. Mm. I mean, I'm really lost very quickly in almost every math colloquium I go to. My colleagues tell me, I mean, in fact, I've stopped going. Mm. And I'm told by colleagues I really respect and admire that that sends a very bad message to the students, which I think it, they're, that's right, it does. Mm. And they say, um, come on, it's, you're like you're a, a high status person in the department. You should be there. It's important to show that you're trying and you're giving the speaker respect by listening to them. And they're trying to be communicate the best they can. And all of that is true. And yet I still can't bring myself to go. Hmm. I even said I promised I would and I still don't go because I get so fidgety and so cranky sitting there thinking, God damn it. Why, why are you <laughs> explaining it like this? You're, you know, even, especially when it's a subject I understand. And I think you're killing it. I think the fact <laughs> that what, there's something very refreshing about hearing that from someone like you, right? Because a lot of students, they might think that they're supposed to understand. And the idea that someone who has the status that you do and the, the track record that you do has the same impression, I think can be very reassuring. Well, maybe. But it might be better if I would stay there and like use my status to give myself permission to ask the hard question of the speaker. You know, maybe I could be I could be more valuable if I would say, hold on, this is really fascinating, but you haven't told us why you want to consider this particular group. That's I, I used to do that. Hmm. When I first got to Cornell, I would do that to the speakers, and, and people were really mad at me, both the audience and the speaker. Really? Huh. Because I was too intrusive. I was interrupting the speaker who had crafted a certain presentation, huh. you know, and I was just making trouble. Well, so I'm <laughs> pushing back against your colleagues. I'm not entirely sure that that does send the wrong message to your students because, you know, what, one approach to this cultural problem is to say, what, what principles can we give to the expositors? But another one is to say, you know, to the students, what, what do you engage with? And actually, one bit of advice I wish I had been given when I was starting an undergrad would be, uh, don't necessarily stay fixed on one textbook just because it was what was assigned to you. There might actually be better books on the topic. Um, I wish I had known that. Kind of obvious in hindsight. I didn't. I didn't know that. I, that's very good advice. Like the idea that you can, for, for your own learning, basically shop around. And so, let's say I'm reading some other complex analysis textbook. It doesn't work. I pick up Stein's. You know, I read this proof of uh, Gorsad's <laughs> theorem. I'm like, okay, this works. <laughs> um, then the rest of your semester is a much better experience. In the same way, like, should a student sit through a seminar that's poorly given? Like, maybe they. You know, you got to stretch yourself. So you can't say, like, don't do anything. Right. The argument is that this is part of mathematical maturity. You have to learn how to just let a subject wash over you. And, of course, you're not going to understand it. That's, that's the, what is so sad to me, that the default assumption is we can't understand each other. But, but, okay, just let it wash over you. And by osmosis, you'll, you know, if you do it enough times, you'll start to understand more and more. It's a waste of time, though. It's such a waste. It's yeah. so inefficient. Uh, there was a topology class I had when I was a, an undergrad that, I had this revelation halfway through. It was just terrible, like absolutely terrible. And so what I did with that hour is I went and read the book instead of showing up to the class. Mm -hmm. And I had such a better experience. Well, I, I don't know if I should necessarily recommend that because sometimes you do want to push yourself and maybe a yeah. better student would ask the right questions. But recognizing that, you know, time is not cheap. And if, if you're really just like not getting anything out of it, trying to wash yourself in confusion. I don't know if that is edifying to the soul. I don't think it is. Yeah. I don't think it is. I mean, maybe it is for some people, like everything else. Maybe there are a lot of different kinds of people and it works for some. But I, well, here's something that I think we should say in case it sounds like we're just bad-mouthing our fellow <laughs> mathematicians and our culture, which so far we have been a little bit. But what I find remarkable is if I talk to anybody one-on-one, -on -one, it always works fine. That's I so can true. get anyone to explain their thing to me. That's so and, true. and they don't even find it that hard. They can adjust yeah. and they like it. They can tell me morally what the thing should be or why people are doing the problem. So we're all capable of it. I think it would really help if we oriented ourselves to think, you're my friend and you want to learn this and I want to help you understand it. Let's talk. We could do it mm. instead of let's show off. Like a lot yeah. of it is conflated with job you know, I have to get a job. I have to impress. I have to get you to approve my next grant proposal. I want you to not think I'm a trivial person. Right. You know, there's a lot of reasons having to do with ego or professional things that, that push people in perverse directions, hmm. pedagogically or expositorily. So it, here's one way that's a concrete way to get around that. When you give a colloquium, if we said you're not allowed to talk about your own stuff. Hmm. That's an interesting You have to suggestion. talk about your field 
Talk about some beautiful work done by a colleague, not you, that you had nothing to do with. You didn't collaborate. Mm. You have no part in it. It's work that you admire by somebody else. Tell us why you love it so much. Yeah. I think that would probably help. Do you do this when you give talks ever? No, I've never done it. Oh, huh. do I myself do it? Yeah. No. Yeah. No, but I, I, I think that might help people be get out of their own ego and just be a better teacher. Because you're more comfortable describing the trivial stuff. And yeah. also, I mean, you can empathize with what, what the in was for you that got you interested in it that wasn't the ownership. Uh, man, that's such a good There suggestion. are such things. I mean, s seminars like that do exist where people do that, but, and I don't know. You could actually do this though. Like you could, I mean, there's, you know, at the like JMM, they'll have certain themes around kinds of talks given. Like I, I saw the other day, there was one series of talks that is going to be prompted by all your slides cannot have equations or words, right? That was the, the prompt. Give a talk on whatever, but all of your slides cannot have equations or words on them. And then... Wait, what does that say that again? Am I not parsing it right? All So... You mean any... The, what What's on a given slide? A picture. Something visual. It doesn't have any equations or any no words. No equations, no words, but there, there's got to be some visual that's backing up what you're talking about. There's something about. on a slide that's not a word or an And that's an the challenge, right? And so then there's <laughs> going to be a series of talks where that's like the challenge, but it's got to be something mathematically interesting. So very, very open to like different... Uh, potential fields and such but i wonder if uh -huh. you could do something like that where you have as a prompt exactly what you just described talk about something that's you didn't do it's in your field but you didn't do it and mm -hmm. then just measure their quality see how engaged people are yeah and i don't know that it would work it's just my instinct that it might be it would it would eliminate some of the problems you know like i've participated in workshops on math communication with other colleagues and when we talk afterward, or even like in between the sessions, um, th often there's this feeling, and, and people will say out loud, I wish we could give each other permission to be more intuitive, more vulnerable, to explain what we don't understand and why that's part of the fun, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't, we feel defensive. It's like we have our rigorous armor plate up all the time. Don't hurt me. And, and there is a culture of being obnoxious, too. There are people who will ask very antagonistic, mm. penetrating, show-off questions that aren't even questions. Oh, I just have one comment. It's more of a comment than a question. Mm. Yeah. You know, I'll oh, shut up. <laughs> I don't want your comment. <laughs> well, don't hold back. Tell us what you really think. Um, well, I, I can, and if you let me, I would happily talk to you for an unbounded number of hours. But to be respectful of your time, I, I think I will wrap up here. But just as a very last a last question, what's next for you in terms of what books you're thinking of writing or what courses you're mm. thinking are teaching? Well, um, I'm spending this coming year at the Museum of Math in New York City. Ah, very good. So I'll, I'll uh, yeah, I'm going to be a visiting professor there. And please come by and, and visit us in New York. I will. Um, anyone listening, too. <laughs> when does that start, actually? Starts in September. It's now we're speaking to each other in August okay, of wonderful. 2021. Okay, so yeah, so I'll be there for the whole year. We're doing various things. One of them is a meet a mathematician, and Grant has kindly agreed to be a mathematician in <laughs> the meet a mathematician that, series. Despite not being a research mathematician, I'll... Well, I have a broad definition of, you know, you're certainly part of the mathematical adventure, and you've done so much, maybe more than a lot of, you know, certified mathematicians, whatever they are. You, you've really taught the world. People love you. My, I think my kids... Um, I don't mean my children, but my students would be happier that I'm talking to you than just about anyone else on the program. You're really an inspiration to a lot of people. Well, flipping that around, I mean, I, I should emphasize what an inspiration you were to me when I was just getting started. And a lot of listeners might not know this, but I think you actually provided some very active encouragement just through, I don't know, retreating something when I was very early on or engaging with me when I asked about doing some collaborative project and we did the Brachistochrone mm -hmm. thing. Um, yeah. You, you might not have known it, but both of those actually meant quite a bit to me. Um, and oh, I think well, great. really uh, little gestures like that actually can matter a lot. And someone kind of just trying a wacky new thing that doesn't necessarily have a established groove in society. Mm -hmm. So very sincerely, I want to thank you for that. Oh, the, well, you're very welcome. Thanks for all you've done for our, our culture. Well, with that. This has been fun, Grant. Yeah, this has been an absolute <laughs> blast. Thank you for joining. Thanks for having me.